Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. I'm Marcia Hovey. I'm the chair of CADRE, Collaborating Agencies Disaster Relief Effort, which is the VOAD for Santa Clara County. VOAD is Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster. And we're here today to talk about disaster volunteers. Uh, I just want to make sure that everyone make sure that they stay on mute. If you want to give feedback during the presentation, if you click on the reactions um, button on your screen, you can do a thumbs up or a clap. If you want to do um, say yes or no, if you click on the participant tab, there's a yes and a no. And um, if you could please just to start off, we're gonna have you, Put your name and your organization into the chat so that we know who you are. And then if you can, rename yourself because it's nice to be able to see the, the name and the organization on the screen. It just is helpful. So just put maybe your first name and the name of your organization to rename yourself. And let's see. If you, if you have questions that you came with, uh, feel free to type those in the chat right now so we can kind of, the presenters can see them and make sure that they answer those. And then any questions along the way, feel free to just put those into the chat as well. What else? We are recording this session just so that you know. If you don't want to be, have your, your face seen in the recording, just turn off your mute. I'm sorry, turn off your video and keep your mute on unless you're speaking. If we do have time at the end, we can let you actually ask the questions out loud, but we're not sure exactly of the timing. So um, make sure you put your questions in the chat. And if we have time to ask, have you ask it aloud, we can do that. All right, this is our fifth session um, that are sponsored by the Bay Area Urban Area Security Initiative. We were given um, that funding to be able to provide disaster preparedness training for the South Bay hubs, which is San Benito, Monterey, Santa Cruz, and Santa Clara counties. Although the information is relevant to everyone. So if you're outside those counties, we'll welcome you here. It's nice to have, um, have people get to share our training without having to drive hours to get there. So this is great. All right, next. So the, these are the objectives for today. We're gonna explore the challenges, benefits, and opportunities that exist with disaster volunteering. And we're gonna look at the lessons learned from current and uh, past disasters. And then we have a great panel of, of speakers that have a lot of experience with disasters um, and volunteers. So we'll share those with you and Anna, I'm going to turn it over to you. Do you want to explain the Otter AI? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Anna Swardensky, and I'm with Cadre. And um, if you see up in the upper left corner of your screen, um, it should say Live by Otter AI. We are running a live transcription service uh, as well this morning for any of you who would like that uh, accessibility. Um, all you have to do is kind of click on the little arrow in the upper left. It'll drop down and it'll actually open an, a separate browser window for you. And you'll see the artificial intelligence um, capturing our words to the best of its ability. So uh, bear with us. It is not perfect if it gets something kind of goofy um, and you are following along through the transcription and have a question, please put it in the chat for us and we'll try and clarify. Um, one of our commitments for our accessibility uh, is also to kind of retrain ourselves a little bit in um, our speaking. And so this is actually something for our speakers as well as for our participants if you come off mute and speak. If you will begin your remarks by saying your name, then Otter AI knows exactly who's speaking um, when it starts to capture that. 
So that's uh, something we are learning and growing with, and um, we appreciate you um, being a part of that experience with us. I'm going to go ahead and uh, keep going. Um, our agenda overview for today is on your screen. We just finished our welcome and introduction. Um, we have a little exercise for you on kind of why are we here, uh, and then we'll have our speakers uh, start to kick us off on an overview of disaster volunteer management and into uh, some next explanations about all of their expertise and wisdom to share with you all about uh, the different programs that they've operated day to day, as well as during um, our current COVID pandemic. And for those of you in the greater Bay Area, um, all of the fires we've recently experienced as well. Um, we'll talk a little bit about pivoting volunteers from response relief type work in the longer term recovery. Then we'll go to our Q&A, and then we have some next steps and closing remarks. So as Marcia said, um, we'd love to see you on video if you're comfortable with that. Um, if you have bandwidth issues, we certainly understand if you want to turn off your camera. So feel free to do that. Um, actively use the chat box feature, your Zoom reactions. It's really great as presenters if we see the little clapping hands or the thumbs up. We know you're listening. We know you're reacting uh, to what's being said on the screen. So yeah, you could do a video thumbs up or you could hit that little uh, 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 reactions button in your Zoom panel, whatever you prefer, but we love seeing that. Thank you, Tori, for uh, giving us the thumbs up. Um, in your participants tab as well, if you have a question, there is a, a place that you can raise your hand. So if you're new to uh, Zoom, although I think probably most of us have become quite Zoom proficient in the last six months, feel free to raise your hand and we'll keep watching for that as well. All right, everyone ready to get started? We'll get underway here. So. I'm going to tell you that I had this really cool thing planned for you all this morning using um, a service called Menti, where we were going to build a word cloud. But unfortunately, this morning, Menti's not working. So, or it's not working for me. So, we're going to use the chat box. And what we wanted you to start off um, with today's um, kind of icebreaker is when you hear the words disaster and volunteering or volunteers, what words come to mind for you? Type a few thoughts in the chat box, a word or two that comes to mind, disasters and volunteers. Help, collaboration, coordination, resources. Oh, I love it. Courage, gratitude, <laughs> craziness. That is definitely something we've all experienced. Training, confusion, yes, very much so. Interface, wonderful. Thank you so much, folks. And if you joined us late, by the way, you saw Rich, he's part of our leadership team. Um, we had people type in their name and their organization. Um, need for direction, okay. I think our presenters are getting a little bit of a hint of what people are looking forward to hearing today. Adapting. Yes, isn't that the word for uh, disasters in general, being uh, adapting, being able to adapt. Okay, so the uh, second question on our reflection, um, keep typing in if you'd like, um, but our second question for you is, if you came this morning with a particular question in mind on the topic of disaster volunteers, disaster volunteer management. Please put that in the chat and Marcia and I and Luna from um, Monterey County OES, we'll keep monitoring this. So as we listen to all of our speakers throughout this morning, um, you know, our speakers will have a little bit of a heads up of what you came with questions about. And then uh, if you feel like your question did not get answered, um, by all means on the Q&A, we'll circle back to you, okay? So um, let's keep going. One second. Uh, Marcia, you got the waiting room, right? Just double check, we've got some people. Okay, so moving forward. Disaster volunteer management is the topic that we came, um, we all signed up for this morning and uh, wanted to, uh, 
to me just a second. So with COVID-19 and with our fires um, locally here in the Bay Area, they've really illustrated that being connected with a cause, collaborating with others to help our community meet needs that arise from disasters and emergencies can certainly be comforting and fulfilling. Um, and so we're really pleased this morning that we were able to assemble this panel of uh, speakers for you. And to kick it off is um, Karen Delaney. I've got a couple screens going here in front of me, so give me just a moment. Um, Karen Delaney from the Volunteer Center of Santa Cruz County. And she is one of our foremost experts here in our, especially in our South Bay hub region. Um, she co-founded uh, Save Our Shores, the Human Care Alliance. She was the first board president of Life Lab Science Program. She served on dozens of boards and commissions over the year. Her formula for success is hope, fun, curiosity, gratitude, belief in people, and good data. Uh, Karen has a passion for volunteering that started as a child and grows stronger every day. She's led our volunteer center here in Santa Cruz County for more than 30 years. She's an internationally recognized leader, trainer, and speaker in the field of volunteerism, community building, and nonprofit management. And I am ever so grateful that in the midst of Santa Cruz's fires and uh, response and relief efforts that Karen has agreed to join us this morning. So thank you, Karen, um, and please take it away. You're welcome. What a sweet introduction. <laughs> um, so hello, everybody. Um, I see some old friends on the list and new friends. Um, I think in terms of the big picture of volunteers in disasters, my wheelhouse and what I wanted to talk about today among our panel is um, what is known as spontaneous volunteers. We used to call them convergent volunteers. I actually think the best term now is community volunteers. And what that means, is, that's what we specialize in our community and how to coordinate spontaneous volunteers and how they interact with the larger community of what most of the folks on this call do, which are pre-trained, pre-registered volunteers. Um, next slide, please. These are all pictures actually from our most recent activation. Um, so, there's a larger field of volunteering in disasters. And I think within spontaneous volunteers, um, even within that larger field of volunteering and all the diversity there, spontaneous volunteers are sort of the troublesome <laughs> but intriguing force that people are like, what is going on there? Um, so I think you know, my metaphor is this. I'm actually here at home. It's like, Karen, she's a metaphor gal. You know, there's a force in a disaster, particularly a large activation and spontaneous volunteers in a disaster are not unlike community volunteers at any time. They can be, they can be, man they can be managed, they can be directed, they can be a great force for good or they can just be a chaotic, uncontrolled force. Um, what they can't be is controlled, avoided, or told to, to stand down. And I think it's really important to kind of, what I've learned over time is to really kind of embrace what's really happening with spontaneous volunteers. And I find that um, actually my nonprofit and faith partners understand this a little bit better than our government government partners because if you're in a nonprofit or a faith organization how many of us how many of us rely on pulling on people's emotional heartstrings and compassion almost every day to either bring money or volunteers to our work is there like a week that you don't do that because human beings are hardwired the vast majority not all the vast majority of human beings are hardwired to respond to other people in need. You can't walk by a crying baby that's alone without trying to stop them crying. And we use this all the time. 
And what happens is in a spontaneous, in a, in a disaster situation, the same kind of little images that we flood and use every day to get people to join us are literally flooding people every day. People I know, communities I love are in need and there is an overwhelming, what we usually craft to respond in little bits and doses, the fire hose is open. And that's what's happening. And there's, until human beings have a different hardwiring, it's never not gonna happen. I also think there is, we have to take some ownership because I think there's a lot of avoiding and blaming of spontaneous volunteers. We have to take some ownership, not only that we could cultivate it in most sectors all the time, but think of our culture, how much that story, how many of us saw the Academy Award winning nominated movie Dunkirk, right? What was Dunkirk about? Spontaneous volunteers. What is every superhero movie about? An average Joe who steps up and responds to a need. So this is a powerful force in our culture. And I think that as it's behind all volunteering, you can't love volunteers outside of, outside of disasters, but then be mad at them when they do exactly what we're constantly telling them to do. So that we love sp spontaneous volunteers because as a volunteer center, they're community volunteers. They are doing what we ask them to do from the time they're little in school. Next slide, please. And the only reason it's turbulent water is that a whole lot of them are doing it at once. <laughs> That's what that pattern looks. They're not doing anything wrong. They're just waiting for a little bit of organization to tell them how to do what they want to do better. So, you know, I'm calling this slide facts, but really it's my observations over time. And this is what I started with. The need to respond is primal and can't be stopped. So in the disaster management role, we should all try, we should, you know, it's a waste of time to try and stop it. In a catastrophic event, like a big event, There is not enough unskilled labor. The need for labor outstrips. And this is what we saw recently here. This is what we've seen in every big disaster initially. And we know this. That's why we're always trying to train CERT volunteers and get, there's not enough labor initially until the cavalry comes in. And so that is the motivating factor for spontaneous volunteers. And it is the solution to that problem. It's a real problem. Um, what I noticed lately is that social media and technology, particularly in this activation, is a total game changer because if we are too slow, the, the problem with spontaneous volunteers is if the system is slow to respond, they self-deploy with the best of intentions in ways that are at best unhelpful and at worst quite dangerous. My, the predictable but least favorite moment of every lightning fire briefing was when the sheriff department kind of with a pain look on his face talked about how much manpower they how they spent chasing self-deployed he finally he started calling them volunteer vigilante firefighters who really were putting themselves in danger a big waste of first responder resources and on one particular day um there were very few days when there were clear flight paths to get in a whole lot of fire retardant. And on one of the two days that there was great flight visibility, half the day was wasted not using fire retardants in a whole area where they were really needed because they knew there were self-deployed volunteers wandering around and they couldn't find them in the smoke. So we have to, we have to modernize and understand and not complain. However, people are communicating to each other. We have to be faster and use technology to communicate with them and not oppose their messages, but channel them in a help towards help away from danger. That's the model. Um, I think that a lot of times in these, the model for these is there's the pre-trained volunteers and they're the real disaster volunteers. And then there's the spontaneous volunteers. They're all real disaster volunteers. They're just different kinds of volunteers. 
that in the real world, outside of disasters, in every volunteer effort ever, you have 80% of the people will show up, two, three, four, also church congregations in every big group of people ever. You have the 80% of the people who show up once, twice, three times a year when they're really needed. And you have the 15 to 20% of the people who do all the leadership to sustaining the hard work. To assume that in a disaster we are ever going to train or change the dynamics of how human beings act is another thing that I think is just silly, stop trying. This is how all volunteers act, so this is how they're gonna act in a disaster. What does that mean? It mean you know, does it mean we should not marginally increase the pre-trained people, but it's sort of like we should think more about how to synthetically, what does that mean for how they work together and what are their roles? Um, and it's true that in small events, the easiest thing to do with spontaneous volunteers in small events is to use your pre-trained volunteers well and to register and communicate with spontaneous volunteers. Thanks so much. We're gonna keep, we're gonna let you know when we need you. Right now, there's not a need. In small fires, that's what we do. In large events, we don't have enough labor. And so we just have to use the labor resource of spontaneous volunteers. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about the transactions of how we at the Volunteer Center have been doing that for a long, long time to demonstrate the power. Um, so number one, understanding what's really happening with spontaneous volunteers. People are flooded with overwhelmingly true messages that they feel they must respond to. The most important thing is not how do we screen these volunteers, it's how quickly can we communicate, here's how you take action. Consistent, simple communication um, that we flood people with all the time, wherever they are on social media, we're staying ahead of it. We use a combination in um, the idea behind, um, yeah, so that people immediately, even if we don't know how we're going to use them, we immediately have a way for them to register and messaging mostly on our website. So I'm glad to see technology. We know your help is needed. We're trying to figure out where to send you, where you are needed most. So please register and we'll call you back or we'll email you as soon as possible. You have to give people an action that is not bureaucratic. It responds to their immediate needs. Um, once people are registered, you'll have way more people than you can deploy in most cases, particularly in the first couple days. And you'll it's like a it's like a snake eating you know it's like a big boa eating one of those big antelopes it's like it's a big bunch you get them registered and then you deploy them over time while they're waiting because they're not going to be patient you have to commit to at least daily brief communications here's where we are here's how many volunteers we need we can't we're full for today we'll schedule we're scheduling for tomorrow and the next day um, Taking the time to do that really it's like creates the channel where people are not self, most people do not self deploy. If they feel like you're seriously listening to them and trying to make them part, all they want to be is part of the solution. So it doesn't have to literally be everyone gets exactly what they want. It's like, this is the solution. We all want the same thing we're gonna make you a part of the solution and keep giving people communication and choices. Communication must be in line with what people are seeing in the general media. So if they are flooded with images that there's not enough help, why do people who have no training literally get in their truck and sneak past armed police to put out fires? Because they see on the news every 10 minutes, not a, fires out of control, not enough firefighters, right? So you have to go with that. You can't tell them what they're seeing is not true. It's like, there's a ton of needs out there. It's taken us a while to figure out where is the best place to send you. 
you are needed, can you be patient, please? We don't wanna waste your time by having 100 people at the downtown center and no people at the place where we've got 200 people in tents. You must be specific and in line. If they're seeing messages of need in the media, then you have to tell them, yes, you're needed and explain how they get to helping. When it comes to this big group of people and when it comes to actually deploying them, we, after all this act, we actually have for fires, floods, earthquakes, we have predetermined positions. You are talking about rapid deployment. So here's the basic rules. Literally unskilled jobs where someone, anyone who shows up who is healthy can be trained in 15 minutes or less, done in groups in public with the right equipment, need very little training or screening. So setting up a big place where you tell people to come and ask them 100 questions, that all that's going to do is encourage people to just go where they think they're needed short screenings that get basic information and have an opportunity and get people deployed and have an opportunity then to so the first role of spontaneous volunteers is just showing up and doing the grunt work in very specific jobs where they need very little training so in a big fire they were shelter assistants they sorted and received the donation centers they worked as greeters, registration, and COVID screeners everywhere. COVID screeners in, hi, can I take your temperature? Let's, let's get you to sign in. And then feeding and fostering animals, right? Um, so someone's saying, how can we create infrastructure? This is these next four slides. And afterwards, we can send you the forms. Simple systems. It's all about having agreement. If they're needed, here's the jobs we do. Um, now, as you're sending people out to these jobs, um, next slide, please. What happens is, um, oh, before I go to the next slide, please. When I'm talking about skilled, when I'm talking about simple communication, this is what I'm talking about. Here were our three talking points to keep people from self-deploying. Go where you're needed. Nobody likes it if there's, we had a shelter at the Civic Center and we had eight other shelters. 800 people go into the Civic Center, eight other shelters with nobody. That is where people go where you need it. If you call us or register us before you jump in the car, we'll tell you where you're needed and when you're needed. Be safe and insured when you're volunteering. In COVID, safety took a whole new thing. When people signed up through us, we asked them a couple COVID screening questions. We sent them by email COVID screening rules and safety rules. And when they got to their site, they had to sign those same rules before every day that they showed up to work. We did not let people who are over 65 because of COVID work in any indoor placement. Um, you know, there were some outdoor placements and some from home calls. But so be safe, be insured. And this last one, why do paperwork? Why not just throw up, which people were, Google Sheets saying, we can do this better. I'm doing a Google Sheet on my Facebook page. And that's how we're going to schedule volunteers because we don't need paperwork. But so we added this one, you know, if you use our system, we are going to need millions in FEMA dollars to rebuild this community. And if you use our system, Every hour you put in will help us leverage $100 towards rebuilding homes and bridges and parks and businesses in our community. And I'll tell you, we sent that out to the people on those self and 80% of them were like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. So the messaging was about community need, but it was direct messaging to help people. We made the assumption, you all are awesome helpers we want you to help as quickly, as safely, and as effectively as possible. And people really don't object to that. Um, we don't need to spend a lot of time, but we actually daily had a script for call centers that kind of went through the same in more, um, in more detail. 
Next slide, please. Um, so most rapid deployment on simple things to do. Um, now, if it's a flood and a rainstorm, who doesn't need people to fill sandbags or afterwards to muck stuff out? If it's a winter storm, a lot of businesses and people need help putting up plywood and sandbagging. So there's simple things. While you're registering thousands of people, there are very specific needs that need to be screened for. And this is where you're talking, you're in collaboration with all of our wonderful volunteer, ongoing volunteer partners, whether it's like the animal services, horse rescue people, we don't have enough people with stalls. It's the care and shelter providers who say we have enough people, but we're short on Wohawken translators. Um, the actual shortage for us that was kind of surprising was the mental health workers. That's not something normally we screen for, but, but we didn't have enough in the system. And because there were no hotel rooms, that's normally a need in our community that is handled through mutual agreement, but there was no place for people to stay. So the other thing you can do, general skills banks in a disaster don't age well. But if you're registering, as we were in the first 10 days, we registered 3,000 people. Every day that goes on as these new needs come up, you can do two things. You can add screening questions for high priority needs, and those folks are siphoned off and actually go through a longer inter interview background check process. You don't do that for everyone. You just do it for the people who need it. Um, so for this disaster, Here's, we need a translation, licensed behavioral health, some, the EOC needed some clerical skill and our nonprofit partners needed case managers. Um, but in any disaster, you can add these. Um, then the last thing is supervising groups of people. You're using, you don't know what their skill sets is. They may be hardly highly skilled individuals, but if someone calls up, it's like, I'm an engineer. It's like, thank you, Mr. Engineer. What we need now are people at this shelter who are willing to set up tents and feed people. That's what we need. If we need an engineer, we'll call you. So whoever goes where they need. If they're working in groups, they do need some supervision. And this is where I think using your pre-trained, pre-registered volunteers who are not yet deployed of any kind, AmeriCorps members, CERT leaders, county disaster service workers, that becomes what keeps it from being a big chaotic scene and a nice force going in the right direction. Um, if you do need just-in-time training volunteers, this system got big enough that we did at a certain time. We have a 45-minute just-in-time training for team leaders that we developed that we can share with folks. Next slide. So that's kind of our simple system, four steps. Um, you know, when we're doing this, these are the kind of results you can get. And this is not just this activation, you know, um, for the first couple, almost couple of weeks, 100% of, before the Red Cross could get here with their folks, 100% of the shelter labor was supervised by county DSW workers and provided by just-in-time trained spontaneous volunteers. 100% um, of the donation centers, we had two donation centers, were spontaneous volunteers with supervision and training from DSW and AmeriCorps. Um, when they opened the Kaiser Arena, um, aid center, CERT went in and kind of did the shakedown and developed the system for the first eight days. And then we did a two day handoff to our, they trained our volunteer leaders. And for the rest of the month, it's staffed entirely with just in time trained community volunteers. And we were able to siphon off a decent amount of skilled labor. 20% of the behavioral health for all the shelter shifts were, were filled um, by folks we found through the spontaneous call. Um, we are still working through the thousands and thousands transferring. We had a stack of sign-in sheets like this. So we are still doing the data entry, but with about half the data entry done, um, we have 
about $200,000 in match so far in FEMA allowable categories. Uh, so it's gonna get leverage, it's gonna have this added benefit for our community. Um, next slide. I think maybe that's it for me. Oh, so not every, not every community has a volunteer center. It's not rocket science. Um, if there is a volunteer center, this part of dealing just with the spont, you do need a dedicated agency to deal with spontaneous volunteers because it is a big job and they need to have the right tools and a little bit of training. I, it, you know, in looking at other disasters, I've seen this role filled by RCP programs, by UOC agencies, by coalitions, by AmeriCorps programs, by United Ways, by community foundations. Um, the state uh, is gonna, the state has a plan to build out and help this function. What I think the key qualifications are, you have to really understand volunteers. If you, if you have no, if you don't normally work with volunteers and a lot of volunteers in your day job, this should not be your assignment. You have to have robust communication capacity and understand technology. You have to be a trusted partner with OES and with the nonprofit disaster community. And you have to just have a few real simple systems for engagement. And I prefer people to use whatever volunteer management tools. We do not use any special disaster volunteer management tools. The tools we use for our regular volunteer management are the tools we preload and scale up because you know you don't want to be training people to use in a disaster every eight or 10 years or 20 years, something they don't know how to do. You know, you, you want to use, you want to have basic volunteer management capacity that you scale up. And it doesn't matter what you use your regular volunteer capacity for. It just means, it's like you understand volunteers, you have good tools and basic skills and you divert them to this function because there is nothing different about community volunteers who stand up in a disaster. The, there's only one thing different between the volunteers who work at food banks and in every one of your organizations. And that is that instead of having to beg them to come one by one, a thousand of them show up without you asking. That's the only thing that's different. So if you know how to deal with them, you just deal with them in a bigger scale. So I think that, I think that was my last slide. Oh, I'm not gonna, we had, we had a daily flow for communication. This is a very practical slide that we, that started with the emergency, started and ended every day with the EOC briefing, just like every other disaster agency. And we worked our way around that with daily goals. So we did use a modified um, ICS system. And I think that's my last slide. I think it is. So thank you, Karen, for that overview. It was super helpful, it's kind of grounding us in, wow, in 10 minutes, a snippet of your 30 years of experience in this field. Um, so thank you for kind of laying that foundation for us. And um, there are some questions in the chat box. So um, I've made some notes of that. We'll come back around with some live Q&A, but if you have something in particular you wanna share as a resource, um, either by answering in the chat box or um, as a handout or other reference material that we can add to today's program when we put all of this up on our cadre website, um, we welcome any or all of that. So thank you again, Karen. And we're gonna loop back to you at the end. You're not done yet. <laughs> so uh, next up, what can we learn from our other programs? And uh, we've assembled uh, three other speakers for you um, from our South Bay Hub, as well as um, another program uh, located that actually serves across the entire country, but has some Bay Area connections. So to kick us off um, for, the first speaker is Molly Tobias. Molly is a program manager with the City of San Jose. Um, she's been there for over 12 years at the City of San Jose. She manages all of the day-to-day -day volunteer activities for the City of San Jose's Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services and their Park Division. Um, for those of you who don't know, San Jose is the 10th largest city in the United States with over 200 parks. 
Uh, she was, uh, has designed and developed the volunteer management unit uh, for San Jose in 2008 and uh, works directly with our city council members and staff in providing volunteer support for any number of different activities um, across time. I personally um, have thoroughly enjoyed working with Molly. Um, we worked really closely together um, back in 2017 for uh, the San Jose Coyote Creek flooding and the um, volunteer experience that she led for that event. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Molly. Well, thank you, Anna. Again, a very nice introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Molly Tobias. Um, so since we're recording this, and I am the program manager for the City of San Jose, the Emergency Operations Center, uh, otherwise known as the EOC. And in my non-emergency time, I do work for Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services and um, coordinate all of our community and corporate involvement. So I do a lot of work with volunteers, no matter what, which is awesome. And it's a wonderful job. So I wanted to talk a little bit today about kind of the viewpoint from the city and how we work with our um, all of our nonprofits and our CBOs. And just to say that partnerships are precious and there's no way the city and county and state could do what needs to be done without the, the partnerships and the help of all of you. So thank you in advance for what you do for the community because that's the goal of all for all of our work is to make sure that we have a safe community that you know can make it through whatever emergency falls upon us. So next slide, please. So we're gonna start with the challenges. So again, um, as Anna mentioned, um, I came into the emergency volunteer world um, through necessity. Um, it was 2017. I actually was um, doing a tabling event for a senior event at the local mall. I got a text from not my boss, but the other side of the community center boss. He said, meet me at the EOC at 11 o'clock. We have a job for you. And I said, what's the EOC and where is it? I mean, I had no idea what I was getting into. I arrived there and they said, okay, you're going to be in charge of the LAC, which is the local assistance center donations management and volunteer management. I didn't know anything else. I said, okay. They said at four o'clock, you have a meeting with Cadre. And thank goodness for Cadre, because they explained everything. And thank goodness that we had Cadre to be, you know, what we are as kind of the second responders. And so we could open up the local assistance center at nine o'clock the next morning. So, um, you know, at that point, and I think so much when a disaster happens, we don't exactly know what is happening, you know? What's the situation? You know, where are things needed? Who is leading and who is working? You know, we have obviously, you know, fire and the policemen, we have the county that we're working with, we have the state, but all that information needs to kind of come together. Um, what are the priorities? In the flood, you know, we knew that um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the flood, what happened was that we had a lot of storms and um, the Anderson Dam that's in Morgan Hill started to spill over. So when that started to spill, that increased the water flow in Coyote Creek. And then the Coyote Creek flows through San Jose out to the bay. So we had um, some neighborhoods that literally were getting flooded. And, um, you know, we needed to help those people. But we didn't know exactly what the situation was. Um, we didn't know the priorities. You know, being in an office, you don't know that people are actually needed to be, um, you know, helped out with a boat and things like that. And where is the greatest need? You know, we first started hearing about it in one of our Vietnamese communities. But then, you know, as we were getting more reports in, we were finding out, you know, that there were other neighborhoods that had older homes. And so they did have basements, but they weren't like um, um, structurally sound. And so they were just earth. So some of those were getting very full of water. Um, so we didn't know where the needs were. And then we also didn't know what and where resources were available. So while I think a lot of people think, oh, the county and the city, you know, they have all the information. They know what's going on. It's, it's very untrue. We don't know exactly what's going on. And we're finding out information and trying to piece it together. 
So it's kind of like a puzzle. You know, we all are a different piece of that puzzle and we need to put the pieces together, um, you know, in a, in a certain way. So making that framework is very important. Okay, next slide. So we move on to our, our benefits. So, you know, how do you guys benefit from working with us? And that's a very um, important part because we want to make sure that, you know, you are feeling that you are part of this whole experience. So you guys provide all the things that the city can't provide. And that is so much to make sure that our communities are taken care of and that our residents have what they need. So some of the things that, you know, you provide as our local nonprofit or CBO is the information and the expertise. Um, with the flood, you know, <laughs> everybody had wet homes and they were worried about mold. So we needed to go find somebody to teach us about mold so we could create flyers and information and so pass that on. So we, you know, we really rely on nonprofits that have that specific information because that's what we become then the intermediary so we can pass on that information to those people that need it. Um, you have the resources that the community needed. So again, with the flood, you know, the Law Foundation was there to help everyone understand what needs to happen next. You know, if you were a renter, you know, what are your rights? If you had a car on the street that got flooded and towed, you know, do you have to keep paying on, on your monthly premium on that? There's so many resources that the community needs that if we can, you know, all come together, we can have a one-stop shop for all of our residents to get the information that they need. Um, stability and comfort. I can't tell you how important that is. You know, we, we're always worried about infrastructure and things like that. But, you know, each individual, they're going through a lot. And I think we've seen this with the pandemic. You know, people don't understand and they don't know. And that was the same thing in the flood. So we had um, some of um, the friendship dogs come up from LA and those dogs were just there, you know, to provide comfort and to provide some support for these people who were trying to find out information. But we had lines that were like two hours long. So just being able to pet an animal was very good. And as Karen said, um, mental health people have been invaluable and we never have enough because a lot of times people just want to talk about what they have gone through. So if your nonprofit or your CBO has people that can help us with that, you know, we want to partner with you so that we can provide what the community wants. Culturally appropriate assistance is another huge, huge um, need, especially here in San Jose and in the South Bay area because we have so many different cultures. So with the flood, again, um, it was a Vietnamese community that was initially affected. And so those were the people that were coming to the LAC, the local assistance center, to find out you know, how and what um, assistance was provided. So all of a sudden, Su Chi, one of our um, great um, partners, and they're a Buddhist um, foundation, Su Chi, Su Chi Foundation, um, we noticed that they were giving out little boxes. And so we asked them, you know, for those people who are registering with you, what are you giving them? And they said, mini rice cookers. So for the Vietnamese community that, you know, were flooded out of their house, they didn't have access to rice and that's a daily staple for them. So just like for many of us, if we go to a hotel room and there's a coffee pot there because we like our daily coffee, the Vietnamese people were feeling, you know, very, um, lost without their rice. And we all know that, you know, food is a, is a very big comfort. So they culturally understood what the people needed and then provided for it. And then lastly, a focused and scalable mission. You guys know what you do best. And that's what we really need to call on because you know how to make sure that we, um, you know, are able to scale to meet the needs because obviously um, needs are much greater during a, an event like this. So many of you might uh, have heard of Martha's Kitchen. So during the pandemic now, we had Martha's Kitchen, um, which usually does just a couple days a week, a Tuesday and a Wednesday dinner for the homeless because they're just a small nonprofit. But yet they had the capacity because they had the kitchen facilities to really scale and do food 
um, you know, dinners for every night of the week, plus to cook some during the day and then deliver that food to some of our other nonprofits or some of our faith-based groups that had the place to actually feed the homeless. So we as the city had access to some volunteers. So through Silicon Valley Strong, which is what the city set up to kind of um, bring in more volunteer help, you know, we could send out a request for volunteer help to go to Martha's Kitchen to be able to help cook and then box this food and serve the food. And then, you know, we were all able to meet that need in the community to make sure that we were feeding the homeless. So there's so many ways that we can um, provide what the community needs when we all work together as partners. Okay, next slide. So the opportunities um, for you to get involved are totally endless. And we don't really know, as I said, to start with, you know, what we are going to do. With the pandemic, I was, um, you get activated into the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center. And as I got activated on March 10th, and we went into shelter in place on the 17th, they said, get ready. And I said, get ready for what? And they said, we have no idea, just get ready. So that's when you start getting your forms ready, you start getting your lists ready, and you start contacting people to find out what they have. But if you could actually just email and be coordinated with us early on, then you can offer what you think is good. And that's the most important thing because again, we pivot, we pirouette as we were, have been saying, and everything changes sometimes by the hour. And so just having reminders coming from you to what you can offer is great. So internally, if you have volunteers um, that can you know, be ready to help, they're vetted, they're available, and you have your list of, you know, you know who can, could go and help do food distribution. You know who could actually help you know, with water, you know, because that's something that you need people who have a strong back with. You know people who have the driver's license so that they could maybe help with Meals on Wheels. You know, if you have um, people already ready to go, then we can tap into it. Uh, again, you know, offer what you can. And I can't say that enough times. That's why I have it on here three times. You can think outside the box more than we can. There was a point where First Five came to the city and said, you know, you're doing great helping with food distribution, but what we really need is diapers and formula. You know, diapers and formula is, is formula, obviously, is the food for our babies, and we just don't have the capacity. So thank goodness for some of these federal grants that we were able to provide for it. But it would have been great if we would have had a nonprofit come to us that said, you know, we can do a diaper drive for you or a, a faith-based group or like one of our, um, our Rotary or, or, you know, Kiwanis groups. You know, there's so many people out there that want to help that maybe not, might not be able to, because again, like Karen said, we didn't take volunteers that were over 65, but if they can go to the store and they can buy some diapers and drop them off at a community center or something like that, or their, you know, faith-based organization, then that's a way that they can feel like they're part of the community and they're helping out in this disaster. So again, offer what you can, think broadly, think strategically, think outside the box uh, as to what these groups are needing, because um, as it always goes with government. There's never enough people. And basically I am the person for the EOC. So there's only 40 hours in a day. Well, these, these are more than 40 hours, but basically, you know, there's just so much that needs to be done. So setting up, um, not necessarily MOUs because we might not um, be formal enough to know what to ask for in an emergency. Cause again, everything is different. Um, I'll just say that the city of San Jose had a great um, earthquake resilience workshop last fall, thinking that, you know, that would be our next emergency. So being flexible, being patient, and, you know, just working with us all the time is wonderful for us because then we have you as that wonderful partner, and that's what helps our community. End of report. Thank you for all you do. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. Okay.
So moving on to our next speaker, uh, Candace Aquino is here with us this morning. Uh, she is the California Regional Volunteer Coordinator for Region 2, which is based out of our San Francisco Bay Area. As the Region 2 Coordinator, she works with our food banks and our community partners in the Bay Area and the North Coast region uh, to address staffing and resource shortages through the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, prior to uh, joining California Volunteers team, she was a program manager for Tom Steyer's 2020 campaign. Um, she was also a former recreation coordinator with the San Francisco Recreation and Parks Department at Camp Mather and was part of the team that worked to expand access to safe, affordable recreation programming in San Francisco. Uh, Candace's passion for service developed through her work as a constituent representative, and she worked for pa Senator Barbara Boxer's office, and she brings to us her experience working at both federal and local agencies um, with the important mission of serving our California uh, residents. Um, here at Cadre, we're new to meeting Candace just in the past six months in her role with California Volunteers, and we welcome her today uh, for our program. Candace? Hello. Uh, thank you so much, Anna, for um, uh, inviting me to join today. I'm learning so much from um, uh, so many of the partners who have been uh, doing this work for, for years. Uh, as Anna mentioned, um, I am part of a sort of a group of emergency hires who were brought on in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so I've been with the department for about four months, um, which feels like about double that. Um, <laughs> I think it's been uh, obviously a very uh, challenging and, and um, the mission continues to change a uh, very challenging time. So, um, you know, I really uh, appreciate being able to, to learn from you all and share some of uh, the work being done uh, through the California Volunteers Department. Um, and uh, I can jump right in. This first slide is uh, some pictures of our volunteers. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Um, the next slide we'll go over is um, the uh, sort of driving initiative for California volunteers um, at this point, uh, which is Operation Feed California. Um, as part of the uh, ES F-17 uh, role, um, you know, California Volunteers uh, was activated through the Office of the Governor to um, assist uh, our food bank partners throughout the state in some of what was identified as the really greatest need um, and the onset of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Um, so as Anna mentioned, you know, California Volunteers is a lead agency for sourcing volunteers and services. Um, we uh, kind of began that work um, when I came on in uh, June uh, by reaching out to food bank partners in our region. Uh, I'm one of six regional coordinators um, and we talk with uh, counties throughout the state that are split up based on the Cal OES map. So um, I, in my work, worked uh, with food banks from Monterey County up to about the um, Oregon border, so up to Del Norte County. And uh, some of our first sort of um, uh, outreach started with contacting these food banks where um, emergency state assets had been deployed. Uh, that included National Guard, CCC, Team Rubicon and other um, and other assets who were deployed uh, again at the onset of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we reached out to these food banks to begin with to learn um, how um, how those uh, uh, emergency assets had been utilized and how we could begin the process of transitioning back into a volunteer staffing model. Um, uh, thank you, Anna. That, the CCC is at the Conservation Corps. Um, next slide, please. Um, so through uh, our work, um, you know, again, um, activated through the Office of the Governor, we um, are operating under the, you know, Feed Cal Operation Feed California uh, initiative. Um, one way that we wanted to bring attention to that that um, that mission of of again volunteer staffing for food banks and other food um, uh, food partners who are addressing food insecurity in the community. Uh, one way we wanted to bring attention to that very dire need uh, was through a Californians for All 
a call to action. Um, so through the governor's office, we put out a call for, for volunteers who were able to get involved, especially at their food bank, and for some remote or semi-remote opportunities like driving, um, you know, uh, groceries to homebound clients. Um, so offering sort of an array of service uh, opportunities to volunteers through this um, sign up call. We were able to um, attract almost uh, 50,000 volunteers and counting um, as of our last date. Um, we were able to make some connections with uh, some public and private partners, which we've seen, um, you know, in, in our work and communication with, with community partners, how important those partnerships can be, like Molly and Karen mentioned. Um, it's really the coordination that, um, that we've seen kind of take us all through in each community where we have, um, you know, our coordinators just seeing it kind of carry through uh, this crisis because we really need those partnerships to sort of be able to pivot and transition. Um, so one of the uh, other um, sort of um, characteristics of this COVID-19 crisis, which we saw, was not only that, um, you know, we understood that food banks who relied primarily on volunteer assistance, um, not only were they relying on community volunteers, but also um, of that volunteer pool, we saw that many of the um, participants were uh, now in a vulnerable group due to the COVID-19 crisis. So they found themselves um, unable to volunteer at the same rate uh, due to um, you know, their either age or, or pre-existing health conditions. And so one um, sort of uh, one drive that we had was to attract um, uh, younger volunteers as well. And so to include really the entire community of eligible volunteers, especially those who may have been working from home or have, um, you know, a sort of altered schedule where they can now get engaged with volunteer opportunities. Uh, one of those initiatives was through the Summer of Service, uh, where we attracted um, uh, college age uh, uh, young people uh, to sign up to volunteer over the summer. Um, you know, many of these students were, were um, uh, you know, looking to, would have under normal circumstances, would have been moving to uh, go to school or, or begin a career on their own um, and had this time and were really looking to get engaged and, and really to leave the house. So um, this was a great opportunity to get um, some of those uh, individuals engaged through um, Californians for All. Um, we had uh, um, volunteers who reported their hours and we were able to sort of recognize those volunteers for their different levels of service. We had leaders, ambassadors, and, and volunteers um, based on the um, hours that were, were um, submitted through those volunteer logs. And that was, I think, a really great um, kind of pilot project that we are also looking to expand to a semester of service, uh, which again is not only a benefit to um, the volunteers who can um, use this experience to possibly get into the field themselves, but also, um, you know, as, as many of them are required to sort of have a community engagement aspect um, through their studies, I think that this is um, a really good partnership with, with uh, college-aged um, volunteers. Uh, next slide. So, uh, another project um, which we were really excited about, and um, I know Karen uh, with the Volunteer Center um, is one of our uh, host agencies for the VISTA project. Uh, California Volunteers has partnered regularly with AmeriCorps um, through many of their programs. There's um, just so many opportunities to engage um, uh, so the AmeriCorps participants who um, participate through different um, uh, terms of service some, for some programs, that's for three months, six months. And for us, uh, the AmeriCorps VISTA program is a one-year commitment. So we were able to, um, as administrators of this program, to uh, uh, hire on, um, we are at about 50, 50 VISTA members, and we'll be opening up a third round of hiring in October. Um, for these VISTA members, this is an opportunity for us to 
again, engage a group of individuals who may be interested in this field and this is their first experience um, uh, working in, in public service. Uh, for others, it's um, you know, an opportunity to get back into the field, but um, these are uh, individuals who have committed to one year of full-time service uh, uh, who will serve at one location. Um, and again, under the umbrella of Feeding California, these VISTA members have been deployed to food banks and other food insecurity partners in the community, including volunteer centers, where they will work on capacity building. Um, so to um, expand on that, the capacity building efforts that they're really focused on are um, not only recruiting new volunteers, but reaching out to community volunteers who have been um, you know, uh, active before uh, the COVID crisis and, and re-engaging, um, sharing some of the safety practices that are now in place that make it, um, you know, more, more accessible for people to get involved. Um, they also are helping with the volunteer management aspect, which, um, you know, like uh, Karen and Molly mentioned, you know, it's um, the organization and the structure around um, attracting volunteers is so necessary once volunteers arrive. So making sure that they have um, you know, VISTA members are, are able to provide this sort of support to many of the community partners who could use that, um, the, the capacity support and, um, uh, and the volunteer management aspect especially. Um, so we're really excited. We have about 52 placements. Um, 47 of those are members. We have five leaders. We have a host of host sites throughout the state. Um, and we are looking to add a few more sites for our next hiring phase in October. Um, these members will serve for, for one year. And um, again, they are, are committing to a year of service. They are paid a small um, stipend through AmeriCorps, but really these are very committed individuals who are sort of our super volunteers who have answered this call of service and who are engaging in their communities to bring others onto that, um, uh, into this mission of, of sort of um, a, a volunteer core across the state. Um, so, um, you know, with that, I do want to just highlight that um, the, the overall mission of, of Californians for All as it evolves um, and as we learn more about the needs on the ground is uh, to create that volunteer uh, core or to really support the core that is um, in effect in many communities in the state and to help spread models that work um, to some of the communities who could use that type of support. Um, where we see very successful volunteer centers like the Santa Cruz Volunteer Center, um, you know, we want to um, share that information, especially in the um, northern part of the state and in part of Region 2, which includes some of the um, uh, uh, counties like Lake, Humboldt, um, Mendocino, we're hearing a lot of, um, you know, interest in learning what works and learning about models that can be successful in those regions as well. So, um, you know, one of the kind of driving missions is to not only address these challenges as they arise and be uh, a partner and, a, um, and support the ongoing missions, uh, we also want to help spread models that are successful to those communities. Um, we are looking at this crisis now as um, you know, it, it is it is far from being over. We know that um, Californians are feeling that on a daily basis. And so um, we want to make sure that uh, we can be a, a resource and an ongoing resource as, you know, we look at kind of the future of, um, of kind of crisis management. So um, with that, I just want to provide my contact information. And uh, again, just thank everybody for um, uh, letting me be here today. <clears throat> I really appreciate being able to, to share and learn um, disaster management practices. So thank you. Thank you, Candace. And our last speaker for this morning is Tori Woods. And Tori is with Give to Get, which is a social impact company. And with her extensive background in nonprofit development and management, um, she joined their team two and a half years ago. And she's coordinated over 150 programs with over 25,000 volunteers, including a, a number of global campaigns as well. And, uh, you know, Tori 
actually registered for today's workshop. So I'm going from 30 years with Karen to 48 hours with Tori, um, but I was super excited to see her registration and we had an introductory meet and greet on Tuesday afternoon and I was just so taken by what she shared with her program and what she's doing and how um, they've managed uh, as an organization to pivot in the response to COVID-19 and reshape the way community impact is achieved through employee engagement at home. Uh, so I want to give Tori the mic and have her uh, share with you all a little bit more about the program that she's done with volunteers and the impact that they've had here locally for us in the Bay Area. So Tori, go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you, Anna. And it's a pleasure to be on with everybody today and see some familiar names as well and, and partners that we've worked with. Um, I am with a company called give to get I am actually based in Denver, um, but I would say that the Bay Area is my second home. Um, I used to be there almost every other week and I can't tell you how much I miss it. <laughs> so I, I welcome the opportunity to come back. Um, you know, we recognize that there are such amazing organizations out there, such as your own and Volunteer Center, and where Gift to Get isn't trying to compete by any means, but instead, you know, come through and support through an approach of employee engagement. Um, we're not the first responders, but we're here to support however we can through corporations. Um, so a little bit about Gift to Get. Anna, yep, yeah, wonderful. Um, we've been around for 25 years. Um, it is, you know, naturally changing um, over those 25 years. It used to look like large um, sponsorship type of engagements. Now it's a really hands-on type of employee engagement with corporations of all different sizes. Um, we do have an office in LA also. Um, so we, you know, are um, based in California also. Um, we have three different pillars to our company. So we have employee engagement, measurement, and impact um, with a company called Pro Social Valuation, and then also strategy. So helping to build out um, what CSR looks like for corporations or what a volunteer program may look like for nonprofit organizations and how you can combine those and really utilize the resources and especially the funds that are available from corporations right now. Um, so it, our work has really changed um, over you know, the, the pandemic. Um, as I mentioned, I used to be in California all the time. Um, and we would be doing hands-on type of activations. Um, for example, similar to Molly's work, um, in January, right before, you know, we kind of went on lockdown, we had about 500 volunteers um, at Hellier County Park with Santa Clara County Parks, um, putting in a native garden um, to teach the community members about, you know, the importance of native gardens and, you know, the impacts of flooding. Um, we used to go into, you know, some food banks and, and shelters and, you know, help support their resources and provide that manpower. Um, but of course, you know, unfortunately, now things have changed and from the corporate standpoint, you know, they're not allowing their employees to actually go out and volunteer under their corporate name. Um, so in response to that, um, at the beginning of, you know, the pandemic, we hosted roundtables, both for our corporate clients and then also our nonprofit partners to get a better sense as to what the needs are, how can we move forward, um, and if we can't do something in person, what can we do? Um, so some great things that came out of that were the virtual volunteer opportunities. Um, however, you know, coming from a nonprofit background, I know that that can be a challenge um, for, you know, just another role to play <laughs> and just another program to offer. Um, so in response to that, we came up with an at-home volunteering. Um, what this looks like is a corporation funds a project, um, gives to get as kind of the middleman um, between a corporation and a nonprofit. Um, we package boxes here at our warehouse in Denver. They're sent directly to an employee's house. 
typically the groups are looking about, you know, 25 to 75. We keep it very intimate. That way you have the opportunity, you know, to connect with those corporate um, volunteers. They participate in an activity um, and we host a virtual conference, you know, another great way to, um, to really talk about the impact that is being made as well as, um, you know, ways in which volunteers can continue to support your organization. Um, then they package it back up and the donations are sent directly to your nonprofit. Um, so this is kind of an approach to have something that is really a hands-on impactful experience for the volunteer and then also um, a solution to the needs for these nonprofits. Um, you know, I was talking with an organization and we did a program for Life Move um, in the area and they used to have corporate engagement where they'd make the no so blanket, um, but they are no longer able to do that. So the opportunity for them to receive 50 of these blankets from individual homes that are brand new, that they took an hour or two to make, you know, really fulfills those needs and allows them to allocate their budgets and funds elsewhere. Um, one thing that I did, you know, kind of want to note is in regards to, you know, corporations right now. Um, they, you know, and, and I love what was being said earlier about social media, you know, I think that this is the awesome opportunity, you know, to connect and to call on um, some of these volunteers and corporate employees and corporations um, through social media as well. Um, they, you know, they also have their dollars for doers program. Um, many of them are, you know, need to use their funds by the end of the year. Um, so my, you know, uh, suggestion would be don't hesitate to reach out to them. Um, they need to use their budget, so if they get them again. Um, and then also many corporations right now are changing their pillars um, in response to COVID-19. So, you know, what may have been initially, you know, supporting animal rights um, or um, veterans, you know, maybe kind of focus into health and disaster response. Um, so I do encourage you to kind of reconnect with some of those organizations as well. Um, the biggest thing for us, and, and I come from nonprofit background, and I just remember getting all of the phone calls, hey, I have, you know, this donation for you. What, you know, where can I send it? Well, I worked for a nonprofit that was an environmental focused organization, so I didn't need hygiene kits. Um, so we don't want to supply things that aren't actually needed. Um, our team here, you know, we are a project team. Um, we come up with some of these projects. We work with the organizations to make sure that they fulfill those needs. Um, and really, we align with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, our co-founder is actually the chairman who, who started the SDGs. And so, you know, as we work through our project, you know, we want to align with those pillars. Um, we do find that most of them and most of our clients are interested in homelessness, hunger, environment, health education and disaster. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, they're kind of an ever-changing need as well. Um, so you can see on that last slide really quick, you know, just some of the projects that we do align with. Um, again, all of these are funded by the corporation. We source the supplies. We make it all happen so that the donations can come directly to you. Um, as Anna had mentioned, you know, we work very closely in the Bay Area um, and have worked with many um, individuals on this call today at a variety of different, um, you know, corporate engagement components. Um, one thing that I did want, and I, I lead kind of our um, Silicon Valley Bay Area relationship. Um, last week, we actually had a program with PG&E where they were supporting the American Red Cross and with just 50 volunteers, we were able to provide over 300 kits. Um, so one of these kits, you know, looked like a pandemic relief kit. So this is something that they're going to be giving out to their volunteers that are on the front line. Um, so, you know, one thing that I want you to consider is if, you know, you have this need, please contact me. Um, you know, if we can help support those types of in-kind donations, that's our goal. Um, 
Another thing, you know, that I, I really kind of took away was, you know, the support and gratitude, as someone had mentioned, you know, the words that resonate with them with disaster. And we also do cards of support. So I just pulled two quickly. This one was from a, a child <laughs> that um, wrote a card. This one, you know, is a card that's directly for the volunteers, you know, from a friend within the community. And I, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, the cards do go a long way. Um, even if it's for, you know, your members um, of your team or for your volunteers or for the individuals that are being impacted, you know, to know that they are heard and, you know, to know that there are members within the community that care about them really, really makes a difference. Um, one thing I did want to mention that's not on these slides, um, that is another employee engagement, um, and I, I don't want you to overlook it though, is the virtual volunteering. So, you know, as we're preparing for these disasters, um, how can you, you know, utilize some of these volunteers that maybe have skills? Um, you know, such as technology or with social media and, and volunteer management um, and really utilizing, you know, their strengths during an activation and cultivating those volunteers prior to a disaster um, so that you can really hit the ground running. Um, and we work with organizations, you know, and, and would be happy to talk um, through this with you on kind of how to build out these programs and, and make those connections within the community as well. Great. Thanks so much, Tori. Um, and there's a couple of questions for you in the chat box and I just want to call out live to everyone on um, the session that in the interest of time we do have um, wanted to do a little bit of a pivot with Karen on thinking about volunteers uh, in long-term recovery as well so in the interest of time I want to make sure that if you came with a question and you haven't heard an answer yet to it or seen an answer in the chat box that if you'll please put that into the chat box now and um, if we aren't able to get to all of the questions live, we can certainly produce a FAQ or a questions and answers document and post that as part of our uh, resources on our cadre website that go along with today's session. So please, if you have questions, put it in the chat box. And I'm gonna turn the program back to uh, Karen because we did ask for Karen to both open with her wisdom and close with her wisdom for us on the need we all can um, see coming, which is in pivoting our volunteer resources in our communities from our response and our ongoing efforts into what we all know will be the need for volunteer resources um, for long-term recovery. So Karen, I believe you had one more slide for us, and I'm going to give you the microphone. Thank you, um, Anna-Marie. Uh, uh, when I got the call to, to would I have time to do this? Um, I was really excited. Uh, mainly my selfish reason, reason was this, that, um, you know, I don't have any answers for this part of this, but I thought there's a lot of wisdom in this room. Maybe together we can help think through a few things. Um, as you may know, a disaster has three stages. The disaster, um, the disaster preparedness, disaster activation or response, and um, disaster recovery. So that we're all struggling with the CZU fires and other fires, um, you know, managing the ongoing pandemic. The idea that these disaster systems, activation systems, are designed to be brief, right? And then you pivot to recovery. So we're, what, month seven in the pandemic. And it looks like we're going to have another six to 12 months. Um, and I'm just kind of curious. My first question that I'd like us all to think about is, and I'd be curious to hear uh if other people are seeing this too there is a certain even before the craziness of the fires on top of the pandemic there is a certain weariness to 
pandemic response um, and both weariness on the restrictions, weariness from funders and donors, and just kind of co trying, what do we need to do as a community? What do we need to do differently to sustain this disaster activation really in a pandemic for this long a time we are really we are really struggling with that here honestly at first it was okay to tell you know at first it was okay to tell people you know stay home for a while but now folks when you think of how many people volunteer as part of their who how many people in our organizations for 30 years we've been telling people who are disabled, who have chronic health conditions, who are seniors, volunteer to stay active, you'll stay younger and be healthier. So, you know, it's okay to ask those people to stay home for a few months, but, you know, how are, how are we, what are we doing and how can we get maybe a little bit more interest? Like I was really happy to hear Tori saying, you're starting to pivot for volunteer helper and safety kits. It is really hard to get, it's been really hard for us to get media attention or donor attention or resource attention on this issue of, you know, the helpers of the nonprofit sector have been hollowed out, the day-to-day -day workers in so many organizations. And we are struggling and that is a slow motion disaster that isn't on the front pages but we're all struggling with that um so i'm just kind of curious to know is that uh, you know i i'm hoping that in this region probably maybe not on this call but if other people are experiencing that you know what's working to cope with that and how might we all work together in the future to come up with creative strategies, both to find meaningful ways to redeploy people who can't volunteer during COVID, but are becoming incred incredibly frustrated and um, starting to be suffer from isolation, as well as getting some resources to help us solve this problem. Um, and I know that this isn't a I, I don't even know if we can talk in this forum, but that is one thing that I'd like us to think about and talk about. And I don't have the answer, but we have a lot of questions. Um, the other thing is probably, this is a slow motion crisis we all should be working on together. The second thing is a more immediate crisis for us in Santa Cruz County. Um, so those of us, if you've ever done a disaster activation before, if the disaster is in your hometown, there is a point where you're, you know, the shell, you're, our sh we closed the last of our shelters last Friday. That do, but we have a thousand, between 900 and a thousand homes or dwelling units that were destroyed. So this is the largest destruction of housing in Santa Cruz County, way larger than the Loma Prieta earthquake. Um, typically what happens if a disaster, when you pivot to recovery, the long-term recovery, you go from mass care and feeding, which is largely on the government, uh, the government coordinating that response and we show up and help, to um, long-term recovery. And usually there's a, fl a flood of national and international resources that come into the affected area with the number and that includes money that includes national we were talking about you know the faith-based construction crews that come in the corporate when our fire when we've lost when our fire here on the central coast is one of i think it's 15 western fires right now not to mention on top of COVID, not to mention on top of 
the first hurricane season on re record where we're what halfway through the season and we're into a second alphabet i wonder you know are we going to be on our own you know to what extent are we going to be on our own that there that the whole system is stretched so hard by climate change that we can't rely on those national and international resources for very much, which means we in Santa Cruz are going to have to rely, as we did in the immediate activation, exclusively on our neighboring counties for help. And how, how can we make that work? Um, so those were my two big questions, and they really are questions. I don't have any answers, but I'm hoping that this work group over time can help us figure those out. Or actually, I'm hoping that maybe some of you are seeing it through a different lens. Um, I don't know if we want to just use the chat box or people want to raise their hands and unmute themselves and chime in, but those were my two questions for the road yeah. ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, Karen. And unfortunately, I want to be really respectful of everyone's time. We asked for a 90 minute window and we're right at that. So I think those are, you know, incredible questions that we're all going to be grappling with in each of our communities. And I know, um, I think Ian's already, you know, given a few thoughts in the chat box. If any of the rest of you that are listening have thoughts to share, um, I think it'd be wonderful if you could submit those to us and we'll put a little document together with both the questions and answers that we've been able to um, pull together from today's session, um, thoughts and feedback. We'd love to keep on going, but we also want to um, make sure that we're respectful of everyone's time windows and schedules. And um, so I want to offer right now a huge thank you to all four of our speakers, um, to Karen, to uh, Molly, Candice, and Tori for taking the time for for preparing your remarks this morning and sharing your wisdom. Uh, what you see up on your screen is um, an opportunity for you to ask questions. There's a QR code there. Um, that's for us and our, our, um, our funders have asked us to uh, ask for your feedback so that we can keep providing these programs. Uh, the rest of the community preparedness series is up on your screen right now. Um, and I'll keep that QR code up on the next few slides. Um, I have Marcia uh, giving us our closing remarks on behalf of our cadre board. Thanks, Anna. This is Marcia. And um, great, great information shared, but obviously there's so much more that we can do. The good news is, is that our next presentation is on October 22nd at 9.30 and it's on community-based organization and government coordination. And this can be part of that, that discussion and should be. That's on October 22nd at 9.30. And then in the afternoon, we're doing a, a training on the incident command system, which it, it's really fun. I promise you, it's a fun, it's a fun training. Um, but we definitely need to better utilize our volunteers and our corporations and our homeowners association and all of, all of these folks that want to help. The nice thing about this long-term pandemic is that we're actually having the time to meet the new organizations and bring them in before we all go back to our day jobs again. So I'm hoping that the the discussion on October 22nd does that for uh, Monterey, Santa Cruz, San Benito, Santa Clara County. We did our, our discussion already, but we're always open to have more discussion about how we can coordinate and how we can better use our local resources because, yep, it's obvious we're going to be on our own. And we should be able to. We have plenty of resources if we just bring them all to bear. So yes, if you can still uh, fill out the survey, then that will make our funders very happy. And it will make us happy too, because we like to hear feedback. And uh, we, I'm gonna stop the recording, but we will um, for a moment keep the, the chat open. So if you have any last questions you wanna 
um, have us put into the um, the question and answer guide. And then we're also going to be doing some technical assistance trainings that you can find on the website as well that, uh, you know, these are questions that could be brought up there and we could try to get some answers as well. So lots of, lots of chances to dialogue as we're going forward. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, really good group and thank you for, for sticking around for an extra five minutes. Okay.